Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for the abundant grace, the mercy, um, the forgiveness that you, that you give to us. And Lord, we just thank you for your holy word, Lord. And I just pray that you will take the, these words that I bring and uh, make them more than I could possibly make them. And I just pray that you will speak to each and every one of our hearts, dear Lord, um, during this sermon and in the rest of the service. And we thank you for, especially for the opportunity to come to your blessed holy communion table. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated, and good morning again. Um, hopefully my sermon will have enough to do with whose report will you believe. They asked for a title three, four weeks ago before um, Brian went on vacation. So actually, I think I have, have it a little, a little bit close, and I, then it's like, I have no idea what I'm going to preach upon. I have to <laughs> confess these are not, this, if I had to choose readings that, that I was going to pick from, this would not have been the one. This is, this is definitely a bottom five or something. So, and I'm not an every week preacher, so um, this is actually the first, first go round for, for these readings. So there's a song, and um, I better not sing it because my wife will get very unhappy with me, but... Uh, <laughs> It's an, it's an old gospel song, Whose Report Will You Believe? We Shall Believe, the Report of the Lord. So I said, well, you know what? I think maybe that might, that might work or, or maybe we'll, we'll preach upon that. So I do want to start with that question, Whose Report Will You Believe? Bear with me for two, three sentences. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to make America great again as president. I'm the most qualified man to run for president. No one can do what I can do. Don't believe these men. Believe in Jesus and look to him above all. I know that many or most of you believe in Jesus, but unfortunately, many in today's world don't believe in Jesus. There's over 7 billion people in the world and um, 2.3 billion or 31% of the population adhere to the Christian faith. And then in the U.S., 65% identify as Christians. And I think the number of people who actually believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of the world is far lower than that. There are many nominal Christians. Many people in Jesus' day also did not believe that he was the Son of God, especially in his hometown of Nazareth. And as today's gospel begins in Mark chapter 6, Jesus went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And in the preceding five chapters of Mark, Jesus had been in Capernaum, which was northern Galilee, about 25 miles from Nazareth, where Jesus was raised. And he was preaching, and he was teaching the gospel of God, and he was healing people. He healed, in last week's readings, he healed a woman who had a blood disorder for 12 years just by the woman touching his garment. And that passage, Mark told us that she believed that she simply just touched his clothes, that she would be made well, and she was. And in Mark, in the 34th verse of the 5th chapter, Jesus commended her, saying, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your, afflic of a, your affliction. And so too the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, he believed that Jesus could save his little daughter who was dying if, he could just, if Jesus would just lay hands on her. And actually, we we're told that the daughter actually died and Jesus did just that and he brought back Jairus' daughter from death. And in Mark chapter 1, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. That same evening, he healed many who were sick with diseases, various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he cleansed a man with leprosy. Then in chapter 2, he healed a paralytic. In chapter 3, he healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. When Jesus taught in the synagogues, the people were astonished at his teaching. For they said he teaches as one with authority. They know the healings, the miraculous works that he's done. And that went further, you know, to 
show the authority that he had and I'm sure made his preaching and teaching more powerful to the people. But most didn't believe that he was sent by God. And at this time, none of the Jewish, of the Jewish religious leaders believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They opposed him and they would even, you know, come as, as all the Gospels, as they move along, they increasingly oppose him because he threatened them, their position as, as leaders in the synagogue. But the demons in Mark's Gospel knew who Jesus was. In chapter 1, verse 24, the man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit cried out to Jesus, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. And then in chapter 3, verse 11, whenever the unclean spirits saw Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And in Mark chapter 5, verse 7, when the man with the legion of unclean spirits, many spirits inside of him, saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped Jesus, and he cried out with a loud voice, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Unfortunately, the people in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth did not know who he was. Yes, they were amazed by his powerful teaching. They had heard of Jesus' healings and casting out demons. Yet they couldn't believe that he was the Son of God. And we see this in their response to Jesus' teaching in their synagogue on the Sabbath. In verses 2 to 3, Mark tells us, And many hearing him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph or Joseph, Judas, and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. And before I go on, some of the things that they, that they said, he's just a carpenter. Well, that's, that was actually a you know, pretty highly regarded you know, profession in, in Jewish society. The Greeks and Romans really looked down upon, upon carpenters, and, but it was not you know, is elevated as being a scribe or, or a teacher of the law, and he wasn't officially that. And as we know, he, he never went to um, the finest rabbinical seminaries or, or the equivalents of what they, what they had. He didn't, other than God, he didn't sit under any great, you know, rabbi to learn all that he had. And certainly people who are, you know, my age and, and many of us, we would have known Jesus from, you know, when he was, when he was born. And really, you know, the Gospels don't tell us much. We tell about his birth, and then all of a sudden he appears for the last, for the last three years of his life doing his ministry. He's just one of those folks. And then, you know, they, he, the son of Mary, and there could be different things. Usually you wouldn't say the son of Mary. You would say the son of Joseph. And whether, you know, some could say that that was kind of a derogatory term, I don't, probably not, and the, the, um, some of the scholars I read don't really think that's the thing. Joseph was, was dead at this time and, and maybe had been dead for a while. And then as we know, Joseph really wasn't Jesus' father. He's not the one who caused Jesus, you know, to be born. But that's, you know, this is just Jesus, one, one of them. And what I find really interesting, you know, that last word, they were offended at him. I mean, that was, and then still kind of is, a hard one, you know, to get. So how could they be offended at Jesus? So I look, looking at the Greek word, which is scandal, scandalizanto is the actual, the word that's written, but, you know, we hear that scandal. Um, but it can also be translated, I mean, the, our Bible's translated it offended, um, but it can be Trans, it, translated as led into sin to the point of abandoning belief. And actually, that's what they're doing, and, and that's what any of us do when we don't believe. God has told us that Jesus is his son, 
And, Jesus, and God sent him into the world to save his people. And they reject him because they just can't get over. They know his background. He's just, he's just like, you know, you and me, if he were here today, just like the, the people there in Nazareth. And also, in Jewish society, unlike ours, people really didn't move up social classes. So if you're born a carpenter, that's where you're going to stay. You're not going to be this great you know, rabbinical teacher. And so they just couldn't get over. How could a carpenter, and then let's look at Nazareth. It's a small village of maybe 50 houses. It's off the beaten track. How could he be sent by God? So they just couldn't believe that God could work so powerfully in Jesus. I don't know what they were thinking about. How could he be teaching with authority and in the way that he did and better than anyone else who taught uh, in their synagogues, and I don't know how they, how do you explain that, but they just couldn't believe. And they couldn't understand, even though they experienced his powerful teaching, and they knew of his healings and casting out demons. So in verse 4, Jesus explained their unbelief by saying, a prophet is without honor in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Even Jesus' brothers and sisters did not believe that he was sent by God. And Mark told us that, in it, or he recounted what Jesus had said in Mark chapter 3, verse 35. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. He considered his disciples who followed him his true family. They were the ones to whom God revealed through the parables, the mysteries, of the kingdom of God. And that we read in chapter 4, although we didn't, during this cycle of readings, we skipped over chapter 4. And the kingdom of God, since I mentioned the word, I better at least briefly state what it is. I know you had a series on this, I believe, when we visited in early May. The kingdom of God is the rule or reign of God that Jesus inaugurated or he ushered in by coming into the world as God in human flesh. And he announced this in Mark chapter 1. And Mark went on in our chapter 6 to tell us that because the people in Nazareth did not believe in him, that Jesus could do no mighty work there as he had done before in Capernaum. And the way it's written, it's like Jesus doesn't have even the power to do that. And I'm not going to say that he doesn't have the power it's just how it's how it's written but but what it you know he didn't I he didn't heal he didn't have the power he did heal Mark does tell us but he didn't heal all the many people that he would heal in in other places but you know he does say in verse 5 he could do no mighty mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them I don't know about you, if, but if God showed up and did that today in our service today, we'd be amazed. Because, I mean, that is also kind of a, interesting that even a few people, I mean, I guess it's not the, might, you know, the level of the mighty works that he's done, but it is a mighty work. It's a mighty work when, when anybody is healed. It's a mighty work when anybody comes to say, hey, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. But what's sad, and I think what Mark is emphasizing is that the unbelief in Nazareth kept many sick and diseased and demon-possessed people from experiencing Jesus' healing powers that were given to him by God. And then in his concluding verse, in the concluding verse 6 of this passage, Jesus is the one who marveled at the people. The Greek word is a different word, but it kind of, it's that astonishment he was astonished at their unbelief. And so he responded by leaving Nazareth and going to other villages to teach to a more receptive audience. So what, we, what can we take away from this short passage? Well, I think first, Jesus performed his miraculous healings in response to faith in him. Last week, you know, Jairus and then, you know, the woman with the blood disorder. But 
Jesus can still heal. God is still at work even when faith isn't present. Faith was lacking here in Nazareth, yet Jesus still healed the few sick people who came to him. And what this shows us is that the kingdom of God grows like a mustard seed no matter what we see or what we believe. The power of God wins out whether we participate in God's kingdom or not. Um, I'm not a young man anymore, and there were many years that I wasn't participating in, in the kingdom of God, yet it kept going. And also, God's plan for me, even when I wasn't giving God much thought, God, God knew what he was going to do and how he was going to call me you know, in life. And for all of us, that call never ends. We have to respond, respond no matter where we are in our walk with the Lord. And with that, speaking of that walk with the Lord, I know many of you who've made that decision, yes, know that the most important decision is in life is whether to believe in Jesus Christ or not to believe in Jesus Christ. Every person who has ever heard of Jesus faces this decision. Now, not everybody has heard of Jesus Christ. And if anyone here present today or, you know, wherever you are in the World Wide Web, boy, that's an old term, I guess, um, <laughs> has not decided to, to believe in Jesus, why not do it today? Because it's the best decision you're ever going to make. The first 40 years of my life, I, I mean, I went to church, but I largely lived without really God, you know, guiding my life. And since then, and I won't say how many years that is, but <laughs> let me tell you, it's a whole lot better. And I just want to call you to the, probably the most famous, you know, verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It says it all. Please, if you haven't made the decision to believe in Jesus and follow him, please do so today. But for, and for those, the many of you here today who do believe, how strong is your faith in Jesus? How sold out for Jesus are you and me? Jesus wants to be the Lord of every aspect of our lives, every part of our lives. I, as one, confess, I, I, he does, God, God, Jesus and God do not have control of every part of my life. I'm trying to give up more and more, but we have to just continually come back and ask ourselves, what are we holding back from God? And this believing and faith in Christ is, is so important. And it's the foundational purpose of evangelism or sharing your faith with others. And evangelism is a passion of many missionaries, especially, including the one St. James uh, supports. And we don't have to be a missionary as we think of it, you know, people going intentionally, that's what they do, that's their job. Actually, we're all missionaries if we believe in Jesus. And I like, you know, I looked at your website. The, the, I know you, you support a missionary, the Kramers, with Love for the Least, who, who I support. But I was really struck by Allison Barfoot at Global Mobilization Mission. And I like the vision that, you know, you have written there that, that's the vision of global mobilization. And that is to empower Africans to evangelize and holistically disciple unreached people groups. Beginning from the source of the River Nile in Uganda, we seek to mobilize the church in Africa to bless the nations. You have quite an impressive list of, of missionaries and that, that you support. So I just encourage you to keep doing that, whether both as a church and, and certainly as, as individuals. Jesus stressed the importance of sharing the gospel in his great commission at the end of Matthew's gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Making 
disciple should be the work of all believers in Jesus and not just missionaries. And as we use that term disciple, um, disciples, we're disciples. And also what's interesting in this passage, uh, because Matthew and Luke also have this passage. Luke, it's much bigger, and it's actually at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but Matthew and Mark's words are pretty identical. They use, it's the same length, but the one thing that Mark adds that Matthew doesn't have, and Luke doesn't mention the disciples either, and at the end of verse 1, Mark says, and his disciples followed him. And that's important, and it's actually the lead-in because the passage that follows, Jesus sends out his 12 disciples to do the ministry he's been doing. And Jesus says, I, I give you power over unclean spirits. So he, call, he calls and empowers them to the same ministry that, that he has. And as we know, at this time, they don't know what the end of the story is going to be, but Jesus left the scene. So we, those disciples then, were the first disciples to carry on, you know, Jesus' mission. And we know they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and that's when they really took off at, at Pentecost. And that and his disciples is us too, because he calls us and he empowers us in the same way today. And then finally, I, I just want to point out, do not judge by outward appearances. This is a very hard thing to do. And it's something I have to uh, keep, you know, emphasizing to myself over and over again in various contexts. Um, Jesus performed miraculous healings and powerfully taught the gospel of God and the kingdom of God, just as God's Messiah was expected to do. Yet, we read here, the people of Nazareth would not, could not believe that. They could only see Jesus as a local boy that they knew since he was young. And the Apostle Paul kind of says the same thing, and I'm going to read Eugene Peterson's Message Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. Well, I think that's a good thing for us to understand when we look at others in all aspects, but certainly people who bring you know, God's message, or really it can be anybody who's, whether it be a fellow disciple who's you know, sharing with you something that, that could be coming from God. Don't, don't discount it. But also, when we look at ourselves, no matter you know, how eloquent we, we may be or, or whatever, we, God will work, it's God who works in us. That's what really matters. And as at, l preacher, at least one preacher I heard that's much more eloquent than I, you know, had said, God plus one equals a majority. <laughs> and so, as I read this, you know, it, it's encouraging. So, I want to ask again, whose report will you believe? God's? Jesus Christ? Believe in Jesus' first words in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I'll add, prioritize him above all else. Amen.